News and politics now. You might have seen earlier this week, we did report on some new national rankings from Wallet Hub, ranking states based on educational quality. They put Rhode Island last in New England, 25th overall. Now, Massachusetts was tops on this Wallet Hub uh, ranking here. And I'd like to welcome now my first guest, who is an expert on this uh, Wallet Hub ranking that was released this week here. Um, I'd like to welcome via Skype. Professor Jamshed Barucha, the Distinguished Fellow at Dartmouth College, President Emeritus for the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. Jamshed, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, appreciate us being able to pick your brain. You know, folks see these rankings, and this time around from Wallet Hub, they tapped a number of educational experts asking them specific questions. Now, I want to start maybe with the Q&A that they had asked you about, and then we'll go into a little bit about the methodology of this particular ranking and some thoughts on that as well. But they probably asked about four or five questions, and one of the ones that had kind of jumped out at us here in Rhode Island that I want to ask you, they asked, does variation in per-pupil spending explain most of the variation in school quality? You made the case it was actually how the money is spent, not exactly how much is spent. Precisely, Kate. Uh, ever since the 1960s, the data have shown that overall there is very little demonstrable relationship between how much money a school district gets per student and, and estimates of, of their quality. And that was sort of the state of research until recently when people have started to dive into some of the details and it turns out, yes, it does, money does matter, but it depends upon how you spend it. And um, there are, there's increasing research now on the specific kinds of things that can improve schools, can improve outcomes for students, such as the quality of teachers or the location of the school, which has a big impact. And so talk a little bit about that, because one of the things in this Wallet Hub survey, in addition to the rankings, they had the graph of sort of spending versus quality. Now, Rhode Island was sort of in that area for high spending, less quality. As you spoke to teacher quality, again, speak a little bit to those areas where money should be invested, because folks here in Rhode Island do know we have a very high per pupil spending cost, and of course, as what we've seen from other rankings, not just the Wallet Hub one, um, results not as high as some of our neighboring New England neighbors. So where should that money, and you know, specifically teacher training, as you said, schools, and where might it be misspent? Well, first of all, uh, I hate to be the one to say, you know, it's, it's very complicated, but it is. So it turns out that things like whether kids go to kindergarten and the quality of kindergarten can have significant impact on their lifetime earnings capacity and other kinds of of measures and often K through 12 studies don't look at kindergarten. We're getting more and more evidence of uh, daycare and quality of daycare and, and pre-K uh, even uh, where we are finding that the effects of early environment and early learning even uh, you know as early as you can imagine uh, it can be lasting and so I think it's a bit misleading the way the debate has been set up to just look at first student K through 12 spending because there's a lot of spending that parents uh, are involved in or there's a lot associated with the quality of activities and other kinds of things in the neighborhoods uh, themselves. And let's talk a little bit, I mean that was the one that really stood out and again when they asked this group of experts that they compiled, again when they released this ranking list all around the country, but, you know, talk with us a little bit about what rankings mean. I mean, you see U.S. News and World Report top high schools. You see something like this, which compiles different pieces of data. And actually, I think the appearance on being in the top 700 of the top schools in the country is one of the pieces. But, of course, the typical ones that we see, uh, you know, test scores specifically, SAT scores, uh, it was interesting, this one talked about school quality and school safety. What did you think when you looked through the methodology of this particular ranking, Professor? Well, I, I think it's a good effort, but I think this ranking, as with all, most rankings, involve uh, 
prior sort of top-down selection of factors and how much weight they get. Mm -hmm. So as you said, this ranking has 60% is, is sort of academic things and 40% is, is safety issues. That's an arbitrary divide. And then within each of those, the sort of achievement and safety, there are many, many other measures that are added up and given a certain number of points. Some are given three points, some are given six points, called double loaded or double weighted factors. Those are all arbitrary decisions. What factors to consider, how many points to give each one. If you change some of those, you get some differences you know, in, in the ranking. And so uh, as somebody from higher education, I think you'll find that in higher education, have not a lot of respect for the US news uh, ranking. Um, because it has the same kind of quality, even more so, where it specifies a certain number, a certain percentage for certain kinds of issues. And uh, so we tend to stay away from rankings. Another question, another point is that if you look state by state, that's too big an area, too big a population unit to be that meaningful in terms of our, any kind of policy about how, about how to improve schools and how to improve student outcomes. It's really school by school, uh, district by district, uh, where you'd have to take an evidence-based approach. So for example, I said there's some economics research now that the teacher quality, teachers who have an impact on academic improvement in the short term while they're teaching, also end up with long-term, significant long-term improvement in life outcomes for those students. So there are evidence-based uh, policy decisions that can be that can be used to improve individual schools and school districts. So is that your argument, Professor? Is that these again evidence-based policies are really what states should look at? Do you just think when these rankings come out, there's a thirst amongst those around the country to just know how they're kind of stacking up against the rest of the against you know Rhode Island here against the rest of New England? But as you said. Um, can be very arbitrary. Your suggestion is, is to focus more on um, policy and, and best results, as you said, based on evidence. Well, based on outcomes. And uh, you can, of course, quarrel about what are valid outcomes. Certainly, uh, uh, test scores are outcomes. Now, they're, they're imperfect, and yet, but they, they do indicate some things. Performance in school is an outcome. Income later on in life is an outcome. Uh, there are even health outcomes, there are outcomes uh, associated with uh, you know, life choices and so on that, that are looked at that can all be affected by quality of teachers, quality of schools, to neighborhoods where they grow up. Mm. And so just looking at the amount of money that's thrown at the school on average doesn't really tell you the story and it leads to political slogans like, you know, just throwing money at schools doesn't make a difference. Well, of course it doesn't make a difference if you just throw money, uh, but it def definitely makes a difference if money is targeted in places that the evidence show matters. Because obviously if you had no money in a school, there would be no school, so money has to matter. And so what I'm arguing is that you need evidence-based policy as opposed to political ideology that drives almost all of the debate at the national level and the state level, unfortunately. And you had mentioned we were speaking before you came on, if you could sort of create the better widget, maybe create the better assessment tool of ranking such as this one, how would you weight things differently? What type of information would you include that might not necessarily be seen in sort of these quantitative rankings that come across our desks very often? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rank them based on arbitrary weightings. Now there are, I am working on in my own research, uh, uh, rankings of higher education institutions, colleges and universities that emerge from rich data, from big data, rather than trying to say this factor is important, get three points or six points. If you look at large enough bodies of data from all of the schools in the country, their finances, their outcomes, student profiles, family profiles, you can use advanced statistical techniques to draw out of that data the key factors and their weightings. 
and uh, those are would be data-driven rankings that don't exist yet, but the research we're doing will will end up producing those, and I think those should supersede any of the other rankings that we use. And you just mentioned looking at it for higher ed because of the amount of data out there. Could such a rubric be replicated for for K through 12 if this is something oh, that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and and I would you know I, I plan to be. Uh, publishing that at, at some point, but absolutely. I think we're, particularly as we're in an era of so-called big data, mm. the methodologies we have available to us are far more sophisticated to try and find the nuggets of, of within, embedded within the data that may not be evident. And I think when some of that research search starts to mature, you will see, I hope, a turning away from these arbitrary rankings that, you know, each magazine wants to have its own ranking and so they can sell copy people. Yeah, they're very much driven by number one and number two, and then the next year, that number one and number two flip as if that's some big thing that has happened. In fact, typically, it means nothing if number one and number two are flipped. Yes, there are, these rankings do have some suggestibility, you know, the schools at the top versus the schools at the bottom, you're likely to see the same thing no matter what kind of uh, of ranking that you have, but the specific location and rank is not really that meaningful. We should be looking at educational outcomes and life outcomes, and we should be looking at a range of input factors such as the availability of early, you know, PK uh, education, daycare, etc., as well as teacher quality and uh, actual demonstrable academic improvement in students' lives uh, and, and how they manifest themselves later on in students' lives. And so Raj Chetty is a, is a distinguished economist in Harvard who's now shown that uh, what he calls value-added teachers early on can have enormous impact later on in life on life outcomes such as income. And so one last question I have for you, Professor, while you're here. I'm sure you've seen it in states around the country. It's happened here in Rhode Island as well. Um, parents specifically not being too happy, per se, with we were doing park testing here in Rhode Island. Now we're moving towards a different model, a Massachusetts-based model. But there are a number of families who decide to opt out. They say they don't want their children to take part in this standardized testing. Um, we've seen a lot about that here. Does that skew the data when you don't have full participation rates? Yeah, I think that makes it difficult, more difficult to analyze the data. Um, you know, I, I don't think standardized tests give you the whole picture, and, and I think there, we certainly all know of, of people who don't test well but are very smart and very successful, and people who do test well who may not be as successful, but on the average, uh, and as one measure, standardized tests are critical and are very important if you also take other things uh, into account. I can see, you know, we're in a democracy and I can see people uh, opting out of it, in which case, yes, we should look at other factors. There are creative kids who may not score very well. There are kids with issues of attention and so on who may be able to find something that really interests them and grab their attention. And standardized tests don't necessarily capture all of that. But I think it's an important piece of a larger uh, profile that we need uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to assess students' performance and more, more particularly their uh, the progress and their life uh, outcomes. Even uh, interventions, uh, pre-K, kindergarten, and so on, that are effective tend to fade away if the quality of teachers is not maintained all the way up to high school graduation. Well, I appreciate us having this opportunity to have you Skype in again after we saw what these results were from this Wallet yeah. Hub ranking. But again, they tapped the experts, wanted to get you on, pick your brain a little bit. Speaking of value add, gave it just that other dimension to some of the data was collected. And again, other pertinent issues in the education arena. We'll continue to keep tabs on you as you look at methodologies and collecting data. And perhaps we'll have you back on at some point soon when you've mastered the uh, the new art of data aggregation. And we'll see a whole new ranking set. And we'll say we heard it here first at Go Local. <laughs>